Well, there's two lessons in that. One is, I can't do it. If I could do it, they would have made me do it. The other one is, it's not important. So by the time you get to atoms in my developmental math class, you know there's two things you know in your bones. One of them is, it isn't important. The other one is, I can't do it. So when I get up there and say, okay, this isn't that hard, you can do it. You're like, not me, I can't do it. And anyway, it's not important. Thank you for joining us on another edition of the Watching Adams podcast. I'm Danny Ladoni. Today we're joined by Andy Zog. He is a former professor in the math department at Adams State. He was an adjunct and later full-time instructor, primarily teaching developmental math courses. Andy talks about some of the challenges he encountered over time with an increasing number of students who felt that math was not important and that they were not good at it. Andy also shares some observations about the K-12 through math curriculum that underprepares students for college math. He also reflects on the lack of a dual career policy that resulted in many of his peers leaving the institution because their spouses couldn't find work in the area, and also observes that Adam State used to be the central hub of academic prestige, whereas now many students in the Valley who have the ability to go elsewhere do so, and Adam State is seen as is a less academically prestigious institution than it once might have been. And he also reflects upon the low pass rate for many of the developmental math courses, often resulting in students taking them two or three times without success. Lastly, Andy discusses why he decided to leave Adam State after about a decade of teaching on and off. All this and more on this Watching Adams podcast. <music> My name's Andy Zog. I grew up in Northern Virginia, went to college at Brown University, and went to graduate school at Stanford for only three weeks. I dropped out after three weeks. I was tired of going to school. But I moved to the Valley here in 76. Since then, I've been building solar heaters and uh, published a book with Steve Corner called The Complete Handbook of Solar Air Heating System, which is still in print, oddly enough. I never really thought much about teaching. My interest academically was mathematics, but I had, didn't think about that as something I never thought about teaching. Long about the time my daughter, Isabel, got to be 18, I thought I'd try teaching. It was really kind of a big change for me. I had always worked on stuff, and I'm really good at stuff. But I had the opportunity to working at the hospital to sort of observe nurses and how they really, it's the people that's their work. And I thought I might like this. I really enjoyed being a dad. And uh, So this was about maybe the year 2002? So I, I went to Adams for a master's degree, which I got in 2001. And then I taught in, in, at Sargent High School for one year, got fired, taught at Alamosa for one month and quit. And then I started at Adams. You taught? at Sargent for a year and yeah. was fired. Oh, yeah. You taught at Alamosa High for School a month. for a month and then you quit. I quit. Yeah. So based on those experiences, why would you decide to teach again? Teaching at college is different from teaching high school in one very important respect, and that is that the people who don't want to be in class don't show up. I discovered in high school that I just really don't like being in a room with people who don't want to be in that room. And uh, at Adams, even though I was teaching developmental math, the people in the room mostly hated math, but they, for whatever reason, they chose to be there on their own, and that was sort of enough for me. So you started teaching there in 2003? Might have been two, might have been one, actually. Yeah. You mind if I ask why you were fired from Sargent? There was a game they play there, and uh, I couldn't figure out how to play the game with any integrity. It became obvious to everybody. They don't require their students to learn any mathematics there. It's not, it's just not required. And that's not true just at Sargent. You're not required to learn any mathematics to graduate from high school. In any school I, that I've been in around here, and I've been in lots of them actually, you're really not required to learn anything to get a high school degree. I had a class at Sargent that was pre-calculus. Two thirds of the people in that class did not know how to add fractions and they've never gotten a B, most of them. Did you fail students? I did, one of whose mom was in the, on the school board. Uh-oh. <laughs> 
So overall, during these experiences, did you feel like your role as a teacher really wasn't to test the student's knowledge of the subject and make a recommendation of a, a grade, but that it was kind of this just moving students through the system and yeah. whatever grade you gave yeah, them was kind of arbitrary? Yeah, as long as it wasn't low, everything was fine. But at Adams, did you find it to be different? You said you were teaching developmental math. You were with students who maybe had more enthusiasm or motivation to be there, and you liked that more? Yes. Oh, yes. And I had some good years at Adams. The last few years were not so good. Uh, it seemed to me that the students really changed. The students changed? Yeah, they came with no expectation that they needed to learn it, and they really seemed to kind of resent the idea that they should. And if you don't seem to know it, you're not going to pass. I'm sorry. Come back when you want to learn it. Because it ain't, it ain't that hard. And, you know, I had sort of groups of students that I really liked a lot and other groups that I had more difficulty with. Theater majors. For one thing, theater is a, a wonderful department, so they attract good majors. A lot of them hate math. But when they get in their math class, it's like, okay, we got to get this done. And they know how to work together. They know how to take direction. They know what a deadline means. They were wonderful students. They didn't like math, but they knew they needed to learn this to get it done. So it sounds like even though most students didn't really want to be in developmental math, there were groups of students who were committed to seeing it through and being successful at learning the material. Were there other groups of students that weren't, that you just found over time were consistently not motivated or not committed to the subject area? Sure. I had one student who failed my, you know, 095 is pre-algebra, which is to say it's arithmetic. You know, we start with this is the tens place, this is the hundreds place. I had a student who failed it in my class. We got along great, but she failed the class three times. I had a student who had like 200 hours. She was an art major. The only thing she needed to graduate was her math requirement. And she was living in, in the housing, and they wouldn't let her take any more courses if she didn't pass this class. And if she didn't pass the class, she was going to be homeless, basically. These are pretty high stakes for learning math. And she didn't show up. I'd had her before in a class that she'd failed. She didn't show up. She didn't do her homework. She didn't pass the test. She didn't pass the class. You know, usually at about 150 credit hours, they will kind of put the brakes on, uh, on some level. The state say, is you're not... you're around here. Yeah, the state is not interested in continuing to, you know, subsidize the tuition of a student that's either a tourist, essentially, or just doesn't have it together. How you get 200 credit hours and no degree, you know, is, is a mystery. But it sounds like there were some bottlenecks there, and you were one of them. Yeah, and developmental math is a is a bottleneck. You know, it's a, it's a question. One of the things, you know, 100 years ago, we thought that the mind was a single muscle and that learning mathematics helped you strengthen that muscle. And we now know that's not true, but we still have a math requirement. It's a discussion that should happen. You were teaching these classes in essence because the standards are such that a student has to have a certain level of math in order to get their degree, even if their degree has nothing to do with math. Right, even, even if, if it's art, even if it's theater. Right. Not okay. that you don't use math in some part of art or some part of theater, but yeah, it could yeah. be argued that maybe you don't need to know calculus to, to go Well, you don't it. need to make no calculus to fulfill your math requirement either. Did you ever begin to question, why are we even doing it this way? Why are there so oh, many... Oh, well, constantly. And, you know, this is something we talk about. And in most of the world, if you said, what would be a reasonable math requirement? The answer would be geometry. But in the U.S., the answer to that question is algebra for some reason, which I don't really understand. You know, I've had a very mathematical life. I've worked in manufacturing in California, and I've designed and manufactured electromechanical devices here and stuff. I sure never had to solve any quadratic equations to do it, you know. I used a fair bit of geometry. Why algebra is the answer to that question, what does an educated adult need to know about mathematics? I'm not sure it's the right answer. I think geometry is a better answer. People talk to me, typically say, oh, I hated math. But even more common than, oh, I hated math was, well, I had a hard time with algebra, but I liked geometry. Or I was okay with algebra, but geometry was a mystery to me. Most people kind of fall into I was a those. geometry person without a question. Yeah. yeah, it's like if you get geometry, it's just obvious. Whereas algebra, you got to get algebra to have it be obvious. 
I mean, the real answer for me at Adams was, I'm doing this to help you get your degree in theater or whatever, history. Did you ever look at the end of your uh, semester at the roster of students and the grades that you were assigning and think, you know, I'm failing a lot of students here. Did you ever look at this and say, maybe this is a reflection on me as much as it is on the students? Sure, and my pass rate was a little lower than my colleagues. You know, I came to it old. It's kind of a, I think it's kind of an old dog, new tricks kind of deal. Some of my students really loved me, you know. Some of my students woke up to the beauty of mathematics, but not very many. Did you ever receive feedback or concern from your department chair or anyone else regarding the pass rate of your class? Was there ever pressure to pass more students than you did or something like that? Not articulated, but it was it was sort of on the agenda. And it's, you know, it's something that we talked about. My department chair, Matt Neering, is a wonderful man and a wonderful administrator. One of the things I didn't tell you is after I worked at Adams for two years, I got fired there by Dr. Neering. He was enlisted to clean house in the math department. And it's like the old regime there were pretty hard on students. The average grade in the department was a D. You know, I'm, the average grade should be a C, but that's by a model that no one uses anymore. Yeah, well, now the average grade is like a B plus in the yeah, grade inflation yeah. model. Yeah. The people that were there, and I won't bother you with the names, but the culture in the department was pretty, you know, under the thumb, were the gatekeeper. And at the same time, I think they worked really hard to help students meet their standards, but there were some kind of loud voices in the group, and uh, they were pretty much universally hated all around campus. Dr. Nearing became the department chair, and everybody left. The tenured people were persuaded to leave. The people like myself who were adjuncts just, you know, didn't get a contract. And But you said some of the tenured professors were, quote, well, I'm using air quotes here for our radio listeners, persuaded to leave. Yeah. I don't know how explicit that was. I heard a couple of loud conversations that two years later, I had a conversation with Dr. Nearing in which he, uh, I totally got why I was considered part of the old regime. So you kind of left Adam State for a while. Yeah, two after years. Those, after for those initial years. years of teaching, you were gone for two years. Right. And at some point you had a conversation with Dr. Nearing. Yeah, I looked at their schedule idly. I was kind of missing teaching and I didn't know what to do about it. Uh, I wasn't going back to high school and I checked out TSJC. They offered me one class which was like gas for gas money and I just I couldn't do that. Anyway so I looked at the schedule and saw that they had some courses listed with no name next to them. So I emailed Matt Nearing and said hey I see you got courses with no name. I'm available if you're interested. This was like two weeks before school started. And he said, well, no, actually, those are just, you know, in case we have more students and, you know, I don't need anybody. But I'll yeah. keep you in mind. I mean, that's the thing about adjuncts is they, they're often tasked with filling sections at the last minute based on demand. Yeah. And so you could be an adjunct counting on a class that doesn't make. And yeah. so then you don't have that job or uh, you might you know, get a call semi last minute, which is, it sounds like what you're about to tell me. Yeah, the weekend before school started, he called me up and said, somebody flaked out on me. Can you start on Monday? And I said, yes. <laughs> and I made it my habit after that. When Dr. Nearing says, can you, I always say yes. And he never, he's never asked me for anything I didn't think was right. And uh, he's always treated me with immaculate respect. So just Tell to you clarify, you so, were working as an adjunct instructor sequentially throughout this time, took some time off, back on again, but you were never on a tenure track position. Oh, no, no. Uh, I don't have a PhD, which would be required for that. I was, the last few years I was there, I was actually something called full-time. You were a full-time instructor. Just to say, I didn't have a semester-by-semester -semester contract or a year contract. I don't know, I never paid much attention to it, but I, but when I became full-time, basically they doubled my pay for, when I was adjunct, I was like 0.45 FTEs, which meant I didn't get any benefits, even though I was teaching four classes. And actually the semester I started back, I had like six classes. Because and this is before the Affordable Care Act, whereby, you know, if, if one works 32 hours or more at a job, uh, they are eligible for their employer's 
health insurance. So that wasn't implemented, I think, until 2012, 2013. Yeah. I was at Adam State when that happened as an adjunct. And there was the question of, well, you know, for people like us that are kind of in the middle there, like I have some committee work, I teach classes as well. What counts as full-time in academia? Yeah. My assumption is that uh, it's a Fair Labor Standards Act violation to have somebody teaching four classes in column 0.45 FTE. So to multiply that out, I'm not great at math, but that's about nine classes that you'd have to teach <laughs> to reach the, yeah. the 1.0 FTE at that right. calculation rate, which yeah. nobody does. I mean, that would be right. close to insane. Right. It sounds like you did enjoy your time teaching at Adam State, but you noticed toward the end that the expectations of students began to change. And at some point, it sounds like you became less enamored with the idea of continuing to teach. Well, I also, you know, I'm 65. It's like my standard for what satisfies me becomes a little more arbitrary or, you know, it's like, if I'm not liking it, it's like, why am I doing it? You know? I wasn't the only one that noticed that the students changed. And, and so the developmental math program was reevaluated and retooled. Yeah. What was the ultimate goal of that process? To get the students done successfully in much greater numbers. Because there was a, a, not just from you, but perhaps from all of the developmental instructors, a lower than desired pass rate. And there oh, was yeah. some thinking about how can we improve. Would you be able to just as a thumbnail guesstimate what the pass rate for these developmental math classes yeah, were? Just generally, it's about 50%, maybe a little lower. As we talked about, that barrier will prevent a student from going on to get a degree. So regardless of what other challenges you have in higher ed, only 50% of the students in this program well, were that's, clearing no, that. No, no, that's per class. Okay. See. That's per class. Of the students who start in the developmental program, how many finish it? It's probably 30%. Yeah, I mean, you're saying 50% per class, yeah. and it's a sequence of three classes. But if you're unlucky enough to start at 095, that's 50% of 50% yeah, well, of 50%. That's right. <laughs> by well, the time you get And there. there are people, you know, by that per class thing, it's we have students that take 095 three times and fail it each time. Mm. Well, that, you know, kind of brings down the pass rate. Yeah. And Did you find that on the third attempt there were students who passed it? I'd have to look up the statistics. Not too many. So generally... According, you... to, according to Matt, who did some, you know, institutional research in this, nobody who'd ever passed, who'd ever failed three developmental classes had gotten a degree. Also, people go elsewhere. So... To finish their degree? Yeah. So it's possible yeah. that they could have transferred out. They said, screw this Andy Zog guy. I'm going to get my yeah. degree somewhere else. I had... I'm thinking of a particular student who failed 095 three times and wanted to be a nurse. You know, she was bright enough. She just couldn't really, just wouldn't really do it. And a few years later, I ran into her. She was working at the brew pub. I said, hey, did, did you ever pass your math? She said, oh, yeah, I decided to do it, so I did it. Just like that. Yeah. She finished her developmental math. Mm. With the number of students who don't seem prepared, why are they in college at all? People go to college who have no business going to college. You know, we, in our culture, we contrast work with school. What do you know about college if you've never been there and your parents didn't go there? What do you know? Well, what do you see in the movies? You know, lots of drinking beer and slapping asses and you know, whatever, you know, just a big party. And uh, I think people go to party. It's okay. People go to play sports, too. Do you it's think they good. ever go to a party with Andy Zog in 095 math? Come uh, on. Not too many. Oh, all Not right. too many. So that being said, you did at some point make a conscious decision to stop teaching at Adam State? Yeah, I just decided that the I was working really hard at it, and uh, I just didn't get what I needed to get out of my work. It just I wasn't I was working real hard, but I couldn't figure out how to how to reach these students. What's going on in our education system? It's a very big topic. I think it's been politicized, which is real unfortunate. It's been defunded steadily over time, and Colorado sort of a worst case, really almost like Mississippi and Colorado. Or something but, like 48th in the nation for funding of higher education. Yeah, and we're not much better in, for funding K-12 either. There's a few things going on. When I was a kid, women could be nurses 
or they could be teachers. Okay, well, guess what? There were a lot of good nurses and teachers. Now, a sharp woman can go do whatever she wants. She doesn't have to be a teacher. You know, the pay is lousy and the working conditions are awful. I was about to say, we Who, might have more teachers and nurses if they were compensated in Yeah, you know, but there's ways. plenty of good options now. I mean, it used to be they weren't compensated, but it was all you could do. So if you were an ambitious woman, that's what you did. But even more than that, when I graduated from high school, the people in my class who went off to be teachers were the ones who weren't good at math. And it's still like that. Elementary teachers hate math most of them. And they pass along that anxiety and low expectations to their students. I mean, that's, that's so, a good point. If you're good at math, there are a lot of, shall we say, more lucrative careers available to you yeah. than being a math teacher. I've always thought the math teaching situation in our country could easily be solved with money. All you got to do is give math teachers $150,000 for teaching math, and everybody will take notice. The students will go, I want to do that. You yeah. know, how do you do this? You know, I'm all those, taking notes. All those brilliant day traders on Wall Street, you know, that can do all these calculations on the fly. They could be in the math class creating value for students if they were being paid for it. Yeah. I mean, the other thing is, if you take a, okay, so you're in the third grade, you're having a hard time. Your teacher, who never liked math and isn't any good at it and thinks you, she can teach you math even though she doesn't understand fractions herself, oh, don't worry about it, honey. And so what do you got? You got six, seven, eight years of being passed along even though you can't do math. There's, we call it social promotion. You're about this age, so you'll go on to grade 10. Yeah. Well, there's two lessons in that. One is I can't do it. If I could do it, they would have made me do it. The other one is, it's not important. So by the time you get to Adams in my developmental math class, you know there's two things you know in your bones. One of them is, it isn't important. The other one is, I can't do it. So when I get up there and say, okay, this isn't that hard, you can do it. You're like, not me, I can't do it. And anyway, it's not important. <laughs> so, and it's like, that. Would, that's really the whole. None of that prevails over that certain knowledge. More than half your life, you have known that you can't do it. I definitely go into the classroom with the belief that every student can make a movie. And I don't yeah. have many students at all that think, I can't make movies and making movies isn't important. If I encountered that in the classroom regularly, I could see how it would wear me down over yeah. time. Yeah, I can't do it and it's not important. Or just the one-two punch. I think part of our culture is that it's okay to be enumerate. It is. People are just very free about saying, well, I'm no good at math. It's like, that's not true in every culture. Nobody would tell you that. If you went to Hungary. Yeah, or South Korea. Yeah. <laughs> in Hungary, they teach calculus in middle school. That's how they do it. Differential calculus in the seventh grade. Integral calculus in the eighth grade. So at some it's point, like, it's like... The assumption just, is everybody can do this. Yeah, we just know? collectively decided in America that it wasn't that important. Yeah. Is it because we invented computers? So we're like, ah, we don't need to know this. Well, see, that's part of... I mean, that's part of what my students come to me. They think that mathematics is something that happens in a in a calculator. And if you ask them what five times seven is, and they punch it into their calculator, if they come up with 12, that's okay with them. Yeah. The fact that they hit plus instead of times, it's like, well, you know. And by calculator, you mean smartphone. At this point, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, as a kid, you know, they would always tell us, well, you can't, you know, rely on a calculator because you won't have one with you wherever you go. And <laughs> lo and behold, we do. So I think millennials have now grown up thinking, why is this relevant? Why am I doing this by hand? And it's just, it got to be where I just, it wasn't a fight I wanted to fight anymore. It's a few years before I left there. It just seemed like it got to be sort of critical mass. In what sense, critical mass? In the, in the class. You know, if you've got a class of 25, and 15 of them believe they can do it and are there to try, the other 10 will be coming along. But if you've got 20 for whom they absolutely know they can't do it and also that it's not important, the other five are not going to bring them along. Yeah, I did teach a couple of college level classes, subbed in at the last minute for a professor who had resigned due to the spouse problem, which is one of the problems that Adams has recruiting and retaining faculty. It's what do their spouses do? 
Do you have any thoughts on that? The spouse problem being that, you know, the Valley has a limited number of economic opportunities or employers. And so if you're someone in higher ed, you likely have a partner who also has an advanced degree in something, maybe is an academic themselves. And so if there's a position for them at Adam State, you become a dual career couple and lucky you. But if you yeah. don't, it can be a struggle. Did you see that in your department? Oh, yeah. The woman that I replaced, her husband was a construction management guy. Well, that's a field that really only exists in big cities, and he just couldn't scrape together work that he liked here. So Not that much construction in a given year. Well, and the, the people who do it, it's not of a scale. The construction projects are not of a scale that really requires construction management. So, Why should a student care about this dual career problem at Adams State? Oh, I think it does affect students. During my two-year hiatus, apparently there was a black member of the math department, and my co but he someone or she, who is African American. Yeah. Okay. My colleagues, when I got back, reported that during her time on the hall, there were just a lot more African American students. That's not surprising. You know, it's a it's a cultural problem. During my lifetime, Hispanics were not welcome on the main shopping street in Monta Vista. You know, we've made a lot of progress. We got a lot more to make. But yeah, the the athletes, they were sort of by team. It's like the softball, the young women on the softball team, they were pretty pretty with it. The uh, lacrosse team on the other hand was they were kind of a bunch of entitled who just didn't think they owed anything to anybody other than their coach, I guess. And Did they uh, identify themselves by team, or how would you know an individual student is a member of a certain sport? Oh, you know, they'd wear t-shirts, you know, the sort of like, who are these guys? Oh, they're the lacrosse team. <laughs> it wasn't just me. Either. I, I asked around among my colleagues, like, yeah, what is with the lacrosse team? What did they tell these guys before they showed up? You're the new royalty around here? Yeah, I mean, Adams decided at the highest levels to start more sports, to recruit more students. And I see sport. I like sports, all right. Never been quite sure what they have to do with academics, but I think that was kind of a fraught decision that they that they made. You know, it's true. It helped them boost their enrollment when they needed that. It didn't necessarily help you as a math instructor. No, it didn't. And I, it's debatable. I mean, who knows what if, but I think it was kind of hard, a little hard on the mission of Adams. I think sort of having more and more sports, the higher percentage of the student body is there because of sports, the less relevant academics seem to everyone. You were I, not consulted. No. Well, and, you know, I shouldn't have been. But. <laughs> Did you leave Adam State in good standing? Did you just oh, yeah. kind of bow out? And No, no. I, I went to see Matt. I walked in his office. He said, I don't like the look on your face. This doesn't look like good news, Andy. I said, that's it, Matt. This is my last semester. So, yeah, so spring of 2014, I, I hung it up there. So. I mean, it sounds like implicit in what you've just said. There are a lot of K through 12 schooling issues that could improve situations at Adams. But my perception is that Adams State has, frankly, it has a dual role. The first role for many students is remedial in nature. It's getting them up to the level where they can compose coherent sentences, paragraphs, and essays. Yeah. And then it's also being able to, you know, perform mathematical equations, at least to the satisfactory of, you know, a high school graduate. So, and then it has to somehow also go on and prepare them for advanced level curriculum in whatever their field of study is. And sometimes those two forces are countervailing, where someone's a brilliant artist and they've racked up hundreds of credits in their department. And yet there's that developmental math class that's keeping them from a piece of paper from Adam State. Yeah. Adams lives in a certain culture. I really believe in Adams State's mission. You know, the people who have no experience in their family, you know, the first time college students and stuff. One of the things I've observed about Adams is that just, for example, biology and business. Neither of those, there's an assortment of majors in each of those, but none of those majors require calculus. And the reason is quite simple, that they'd lose half their major, which would kill off the department mostly. Cal what is calculus? Calculus is the study of how things change, that's differential calculus, and how things accumulate, that's integral calculus. You think a business major might want to know about those things? Likewise, biology, you know. So in your opinion, should those and perhaps other majors include calculus among their degree plan requirements? They do. They are required at 
colleges that are higher on the ladder of academia than Adams is. What does it mean to have a degree in business where you haven't ever really been exposed to calculus? I mean, I think it would be desirable for the graduates to have those things. Well, as far as whether Adams should mm. require it, oh, I don't really have an opinion about that. There are definitely pros and cons. I mean, what would it mean to lose half your majors? This is not the little Harvard on the prairie out here. This is uh, Adams State College, where people with limited academic background go to get edu- become educated. Well, certainly those question. students aren't demanding of the school to learn calculus because they probably don't see the value in it for their program to begin with. I would imagine if it was driven by students, it might be different than if it was being imposed. Like if I completed a biology degree and we never did, you know, population studies, ecology, we didn't dissect anything or learn anatomy, I too would be like, wait a minute, I need these things for my degree. But calculus isn't really on the radar, I would imagine. Right. Well, and certainly now we're seeing with the Higher Learning Commission placing Adam State University on academic probation, that there are concerns about the academic rigor of some of its programs. And that does lead one to wonder at what point you're willing to sacrifice a certain set of standards so that you can achieve a certain pass rate. And if Andy Zog is the kind of professor who's known to have a higher rate of of failing students, then, you know, maybe Andy is part of the problem because we want to get a certain rate of degree completion. Yeah, well, it's a, you know, it's something that the, you don't have to deal with at Brown. It's something you have to deal with at Adams State. You know, 60 years ago, if you were a good high school student in Antonito or La Jara, Monte Vista, wherever, you went to Adams State. And then now that's not true. Now the best students at Centauri go to Yale or Stanford or CC. The maybe not quite tip of the top of the iceberg, they go to CU and, uh, you know, so on. They go out of the valley so that the Adams, unfortunately, doesn't get students that would sort of be their, in some ways, their natural constituency. I will observe that when I taught at Adam State, I had over the years quite a few high school concurrent students from Alamosa High School, and they would frequently outperform Adam State College oh, students. Yeah. And yeah. and the, those college students would look over like, "Where are you from?" And they said, "We're in high school." And it just <laughs> you know it was an eye opener for them. And, yeah. and those students did not go to Adam State. One of them right now is yeah, on the East Coast. Right. One of them is on the West Coast. And they grew up here. They could have gone here quite affordably, but yeah. there are reasons they chose not to. Maybe they wanted to get out of the valley. I know I did. Yeah. Well, um, when I first showed up in the math department there as a student, I met Marty Zerger and told him who I was. He said, oh, are you Isabel's father? I said, yeah. My daughter, when she was in high school, had taken his college algebra class and had gotten the best score of any student he'd ever had in there. Well, guess what? She didn't go to Adams. So... So maybe around 1960, good high school students in the Valley would say, I'm going to Adam State. And around the year 2000, good high school students from the Valley would say, I'm going to see you. I'm going to see you. I'm going to Yale. I'm going to Harvard or I'm going to CC. But that's not inevitable. I mean, it could be different. It doesn't have to be this way. Or does it? I mean, it used to be people in La Jara got married and went to Alamosa for their honeymoon. (laughs) (laughs) Well... I grew up 13 miles from D.C., and we went into D.C. twice a year. People just didn't didn't travel as much. Their horizons were much closer. That's not coming back. I mean, Adams has a marvelous mission. The hardship for Adams is that they don't get the cream of the Valley students. Well, I've now interviewed several students who basically said, look, even though I'm living here, I have all of these online programs that I can take. I don't have to take them at Adams State. Uh, Thomas Friedman's book, uh, The World is Flat, uh, basically arguing that we don't live in the kind of geographically yeah. determined set of paradigms anymore. So yeah, Adam State is no longer just the regional hub of education. It has to be really good at something on a national and maybe even international level. Yeah, my daughter finished high school in Italy. Thank you for joining us today. I'm glad you could come by and share your experiences teaching math at Adam State. Goodbye, everyone.